Elizabeth, I guess, that's going to school there. And uh, you know, keep our missionaries in, in prayer. Uh, they are they're regular families with husband, wife, kids, and uh, all the problems that go along with that and need, need your prayers. Uh, you know, Jeremy... Um, Buster, Buster. My, my mind went by. I was going to say Jeremy Tonga. <laughs> Jeremy Buster has been coming along on Sunday mornings and, and been bringing folks with him. And, uh, that's good. Uh, pray for his folks. You know, they had that big storm recently. And I asked him, said, are they still seeing stars? Because <laughs> the roof blew off their house. So uh, be in prayer for them. And if the Lord lays it on your heart, we, we certainly could uh, send them a special offering. I know that would be a, a blessing uh, to them. We're in 2 Corinthians on Sunday evenings. I guess any time I go through a book, I think, oh, this is my favorite book. <laughs> uh, 2 Corinthians, what a blessing uh, to see what the Lord has, has put here. We, uh, we've covered chapter 1, and he, he talks about how tribulations can, can do some good things for us. You know, when we get in trouble, as Christians, we seek out the Lord, and the Lord helps us. And that's a blessing. And then he helps us to help others when they have trouble. And he also helps us to see whether we're really living by faith or not. So there's some good things that God can do with, with the troubles that we face. And we looked last week at, at conscience and how God wants us just to, to live by his grace. And, uh, you know, what a blessing it is that we, that we can do that. There's some great verses. I'd encourage you as we go through here, you know, just pick out a verse each week and, and memorize it. Uh, I think... Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 12 would be good, and chapter 2, verse 14, you'll see, is, is a great one. Uh, but let me read 2 Corinthians 2. Uh, we'll read uh, most of the chapter, starting in verse 1. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice." having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him, and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. We're going to stop reading there. Uh, the title tonight is Satan's Devices, Victory in Jesus. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's talking about a situation in their church. If you've read First and Second Corinthians, uh, you know that he dealt with a lot of problems in First Corinthians. Uh, there were some, some really awful things going on. Uh, they uh, had to discipline various one, and, and particularly... He mentions in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And so sexual sin was going on in the church. And he said, and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned uh, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So they, they dealt with the things that were going on. And evidently, uh, a man had been put out of the church who was now repentant. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd changed his mind. He, he'd repented. And he said, now you need to forgive him. <laughs> you know, that, that's the way it works. And he ends, that portion I read ends with, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Uh, that, that's a real important phrase for you to remember. For many Christians, I guess we have to add, we shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. You know, if you'll read the Bible, you won't be ignorant of his devices. Uh, Satan is not um, clever. He, he, he's not ingenious. Uh, he doesn't think up new things. Satan's an imitator. And he doesn't use new methods. He uses the same thing over and over. And unfortunately, we fall for his tricks a lot of the time. Same trick, oh, we do it again. And one of Satan's devices is 
when he talks about it in 1 Corinthians, he says, overlook sin. Oh, well, people in the church are sinning. Just eh, don't worry about it. Yeah, we do that in our own lives. It's amazing what we can overlook in our lives. You know, we, we're quick to point it out in others, but uh, overlooking sin is not the right option. And it's a, it's a trick of Satan. The, the other is to not forgive sin. Now, those are two extremes. Ignore sin or deal with it and just don't forgive. God is in the middle. See, what God says is deal with sin, look for repentance, and when they repent, forgive and go on. You know, don't hold a grudge. Don't, uh, don't live in the past. Uh, you know, Satan sees any part of your life as a target. <laughs> you know, anything that's good, you know, sometimes Satan will attack you at your strong points because you're thinking, oh, I'm strong at this. <laughs> Sometimes he'll attack you at your weak points, but he'll attack you at any point. He doesn't care. Uh, he's a liar and a murderer, and you, you know everything's fair game for him. So don't let him use good things for ill. You know, we're supposed to deal with sin, but that doesn't mean that we walk away from people. You know, it doesn't mean we say, I you know, have nothing to do with you when, when they're responding in a, in a biblical way. And you know, We need to have the opportunity to repent uh, when that comes. Um, Satan has many devices. Uh, the word device there means mind or thought. So what he's talking about is the mind of Satan. You know, we can, through the scriptures, we can see how, how he thinks and how he works, and we don't have to be tricked. You know, device you usually think of as a clever scheme. Well, that's, that's the way he is. There's other devices that scripture goes into. And I won't go into everything tonight, but um, for instance, with Adam and Eve, Satan said to them, hath God said? Satan is a slanderer. Satan is a liar. And he loves to slander and twist God's word. You know, there's a lot of people around who will take scriptures and, and they'll just twist it and turn it. And Man, it can be real confusing. We've got to be careful. Uh, Satan encourages ignorance of God's word. He encourages us just to take it however we want it to mean. Well, that, that's not the way. Uh, there's only one interpretation of Scripture, and that's God's. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not important what you or I think. It's important what God thinks. And that's what we're looking for when we're reading God's Word. Uh, Satan wants to, to slander God's Word. Uh, he said to Adam and Eve, if you'll do this, you'll be as God's. And what's that? He attacks us at pride. It's nothing new. He did it with Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, promote self. Uh, Dora and I were talking the other day, and, and she was saying how you know, it's just a, a real problem nowadays. The God that you're trying to get, to, you're trying to get people to deny is themselves. <laughs> you know, people th think they're God. In uh, James chapter 4 and, and verse 6, he says, He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You know, Satan knows that. He knows God resists the proud. So he says, be proud. You know, you'll be like God. As well, uh, look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. This is one of the verses we memorized last year. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So he takes you right back to the beginning. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, another of Satan's devices is complexity. He wants to make it look too hard. Yeah, oh, you know, and, and sometimes you feel like that. Oh, it's just too hard. Um, he, he has a, a bag of tricks. And uh, he, he, he uses, we, oh, boy. He uses, the Bible uses the word beguile here. Beguile. I mean, it has to do with trickery. He wants to, you know, it's like the, the magicians. You're looking here and they're doing something else. And you think, ooh, magic, you know. <laughs> Uh, that's the way Satan wants to do. He wants to get your eyes off of the, the primary thing. And his purpose is to corrupt. H have you ever heard the, the term, that's the thin edge of the wedge? That's the way Satan works. Uh, this is just a little thing. You know, it, it's okay, just do this little thing. But it's, what you don't know, it's the thin edge of the wedge. I was trying to think, there's a saying, it's something like, uh, don't let the camel get his head in your tent. Because <laughs> if you do... The camel will be in your tent. <laughs> and that's the way Satan operates. He wants you just to, uh, he operates subtly. He wants you just to think of it as a, a little thing. He, he beguiles you through, through subtlety. 
He says things like, well, if God really loved you, this wouldn't be happening to you. And he wants you to, to approach it from a physical point of view. You know, Satan loves to do things and then get people to blame God for it. That happens all the time. There's one that, I can't remember who pointed this out to me, but in Job chapter 1, remember when Job, all those things were happening, just one thing after another? One of them was, it's in Job 1 verse 16, a man comes and tells him, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. Well, stop and think about this a minute. Who was it that was afflicting Job? Was it God or Satan? It was Satan. Now, God gave him permission. But that, you know, that man didn't know what he was saying. But he's, he's saying, God has sent fire from heaven. Well, I think that's a, pretty typical of, of the way Satan likes to operate. You know, he tempts Adam and Eve to sin, and then he, he blames God for the problems that they have and the, the, the results that we have. Satan is the, the great deceiver, and he loves to complicate things. If, if you're still there in, in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, look at verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you've not received, or another gospel which you've not accepted, you might well bear with him. He wants to trick us uh, with a different gospel, with a different Christ, you know, with a different spirit and so on. Uh, he, wants, uh, he wants to deceive us. Satan is the great deceiver. Jesus is the great redeemer. And we need to keep with the simplicity that's in Christ. Satan loves to complicate things, and he wants us to fight the battle in the flesh, especially our feelings. And we all have feelings. God gave us feelings. They're, they have a purpose. But that's not the point of life. The point of, of life is not just that we feel good. There'll be times when you feel good. Sometimes you'll feel real good when you've done something wrong. <laughs> There's people who rob you and they say, all right, <laughs> we robbed them. You know, uh, that's not what we want to go by. Let me ask you, what's a verse that you know or should know about the flesh? Somebody got one that just comes, comes to mind? It's Romans 7. Yeah, he says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. See, that's, that's where Satan wants you to fight the battle. No, no questions right now. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Uh, Satan wants you to fight the battle in the flesh. But you see, our, our weapons, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, he says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, he wants you where you have no strength. God says, that's not where your strength is. Your strength is in the Spirit. We have, we have power, like uh, we'll see. We have victory in Jesus. He wants you to operate in, in your feelings. Uh, there's another trick here in chapter uh, 10, verse 12. Just pass, point this out in passing. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Here's another device that Satan uses. Comparison. Not, not a good way to operate. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And Satan wants us to be impatient with God's will. You know, some of the times you'll get in the most trouble is when you get ahead of God. It might be something that God's going to do in your life, but you get ahead of him and, listen, you're going to be out there on your own. That's not where you want to be. James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Boy, there's some strange verses in the Bible, aren't there? You know, the one that always comes to my mind is when the disciples were persecuted, you know, they were punished, and they counted it all joy that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. <laughs> Man, isn't the Christian life contrary? And here he says, James 1, 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God wants us to be patient. Don't get impatient with God's will. Later on, he says in James 1, 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. You see, sin has a, a progression. It starts with temptation, 
He says, every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Now, we don't want to get there. Satan, wa Satan wants you just to get started in that process. It'll be all right. This is just a little thing. You know, he'll, he uses all kinds of devices to get us going the wrong way. Satan has many devices. Now, as you read your Bible, uh, be aware of those. Thank God that we're not ignorant of them. Secondly, thank God that there's victory in Jesus. Go back to 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 12. The verses 12 and 13, I think he's basically saying here, he could have let this be a discouragement to him. Uh, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence unto Macedonia. Yeah, all kinds of circumstances come up, don't they? And you can let it be a, a hindrance. You can, you know, throw up your hands and, and give up. Or, uh, or you can just say, well, the Lord has something different for me. Boy, isn't this exciting. Life is not going to be what I thought it was. And then verse 14, it's such a key verse. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. There's a lot of different ways the Bible says it, but it's just saying we have victory in Jesus. We already have it. This is the simplest approach to life possible. <laughs> uh, Satan is the enemy. We're on God's side. Satan is defeated. Jesus has the victory. Now, we're, we're going through life physically. We have a physical body. But that's, uh, that's not the most important thing. It's not our feelings. It's not the flesh. It's eternity. And we don't always see what God is doing. Christ triumphed. You know, Satan wants you to ignore that. <laughs> he doesn't want you to think about victory in Jesus. He wants you to think about that person that said that mean thing. Or that situation that's not working the way you think it should be working. Listen, if you'll look for what God's doing, if you'll let him be God and say, well, Lord, what are you going to do? You know, what do you want me to do? You'll have a different life. But if you worship at the throne of self, hey, listen, that's not a God worth worshiping. <laughs> But that's where Satan will take you. He wants you to be in the flesh. He wants you to, to walk in that way. Uh, Christ's triumph. Christ's victory. There, there's a lot of verses that, that talk about this. Uh, John 16, 33. These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Man, what a blessing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. A great chapter to go to when you, wanna, when you need to think about the victory is Romans 8. Great chapter. Romans 8, 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 37, Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I understand that phrase. How can you be more than a conqueror? But we are. <laughs> we're not just on the victory side. We're more than on the victory side. Man, that's exciting. And the Bible gives us cures for these things that Satan is doing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. You know that verse. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, if you don't know what the armor of God is, you better find out. <laughs> Ask God to teach you. Uh, study God's word and see. Uh, he says here, we can stand against his devices, his wiles, his tricks. Uh, James chapter 4 and verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. you know, Satan is he's kind of like some of the way these animals do. You know, the, the apes and the lions and things. They roar, and, and you're supposed to be scared and run off. You know, and the apes, they come out and they beat their chest and so on. You're supposed to be scared and run off. But if you, you stand up to them, they run off. You know, and that's what, what he's saying. Just resist the devil. Submit to God. Th those are two parts of the same thing. Uh, there's a cure for, for Satan's devices. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Well-known verse normally. He says, uh, the verse before is, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, 
three, at least three things there. Resist, do it steadfastly, do it in the faith. Not in the flesh, in the faith. When Jesus was tempted, what did he use? Scripture. He quoted Scripture to him. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that, in, that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Uh, maybe we should just cross out that part after you've suffered a while. No, better not. Uh, it's there. We've, we've got to believe it. Uh, there's victory in Jesus. There's cures for these devices that, that Satan uses. Christ's part is the victory. Our part, go back there to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Our part is to make manifest the savor of his knowledge in every place. That's our part. Now, I understand savor basically as a smell. Have you ever been walking along and you go past the bakery? And you think, ooh, man, I could use a croissant right now. <laughs> We used to drive by a place, and it sounds funny, but it was a potato place. And you drive by, and you think, ooh, that smells good. You know, it smells like French fries, or I don't know, what, you know potatoes. Uh, sometimes door knocking, they'll, they'll open the door, and you think, ooh. And sometimes they'll even say, now, was this the day I was supposed to come for dinner? <laughs> Nobody's ever invited me in for dinner, but anyway. Uh, you know, a good smell makes you, you think, ooh, I could use some of that. And what God is saying here is, that's what we need to be in the world. We need to quit being a bad smell in the world and be a good smell. <laughs> we need to attract people to the Lord. Maketh manifest, the words mean make evident to the senses. Maketh manifest, make evident to the senses. People need to experience in some way through us the fruit of the Spirit, the joy of the Lord, the, the things that are good of God. Uh, the savor of His knowledge is the attractiveness of knowing Him. Now stop and think. All the time you've been a Grumble guts. <laughs> yeah, I've had people in our, in our church where, you know, the, the wife is saved and maybe and the husband isn't. And half the time they're going home complaining about things and then wondering why their husband isn't getting saved. Oh, that preacher, you know, you know what he said to me? <laughs> he said, I'm a grumble guts. Whatever, you know. Uh, we need to, to show the good smell of the Lord. We need to be aware of that. He says... There's some real complicated words here in, uh, as to who's supposed to do it. By us. <laughs> he says, we're the ones who are supposed to be attracting people. And the place is in every place. You know, there's nowhere where you shouldn't have a good testimony for the Lord. Uh, we can't cheat at work and be right at church. You know, we, we can't be mean to the teacher at school and expect to have a good testimony for the Lord. In every place, home, church, work, school. Yeah, I, I think for me, that, that sometimes the hardest place is, uh, well, I, I won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, we need to be a, a good saver for the Lord. Let me ask you, how are you smelling? <laughs> who, is, who are the people who are smelling your life? Yeah, you, you've met people where they say, well, I, I don't want to be a Christian. I knew a Christian. And man, they put me off. But you'll know others who'll say, I wasn't a Christian until so-and-so came into my life. And man, I, I wanted what they had. And that's, that's the way we should be. I know we're not perfect, and we're not always going to do the right thing, but our message is, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that should be our, our testimony. And we should prepare ourselves for that every day. Verse 15, he says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we're the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto the life. And who is sufficient for these things? Now, now my understanding of that is that some people, you, you know, some of the nicest smells, sometimes people aren't going to like them. And uh, this savor that we're, that we're supposed to be giving of the Lord, some people are going to say, Ooh, I don't, I don't like that smell. That's the savor of death. They'll think the gospel stinks. But listen, uh, God can change their smeller <laughs> if, if we'll, we'll be consistent. We need to be careful. We're just proclaiming the right message and being right with the Lord. Verse 17, he says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, 
but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Listen, we don't have to add anything to the smell of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to change it, is what I'm saying. We need to be sincere. We need to be honest about the things of the Lord. That doesn't mean that we say everything to everybody, uh, but we, just, we need to be honest. We don't want to, uh, to color the Word of God. We don't want to change it to, to what we think people will accept and people will like. What do they call that? Social gospel and different things for it. Uh, we need to be sincere. Uh, we need to remember that uh, God is watching. As of God and the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Uh, the Lord is watching. He's watching our life, and it's important. I'll tell you who else is watching. People are watching. And, uh, you know, there's times in life where the best thing you can do is to tell somebody you've been wrong. <laughs> and that'll be a testimony of the Lord. But I'll tell you what, most people won't, won't do that. They'll wrong you left, right, and center and, and make excuses. As Christians, we need to be sincere and honest. And if we do the wrong thing, we'll just, just own it. Uh, our message must be scriptural and sincere. Listen, we can't tack God onto our life. He's got to be the center and soul of our life if we're going to be a sweet saver. So, thank God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. You know, we sing songs like, Victory in Jesus. Uh, we need to believe it. Uh, let me ask you, first of all, are you in Christ? Do you know Christ is your Savior? If you are, do you believe him here in verse 14 when he says always? That's hard. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. We have victory in Jesus. If you know Christ is your Savior, you need to believe him when he says that. And thank God that we can take the message of Christ and know that we're doing the right thing. You know, there's a lot of things in life where you think, oh, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Listen, if you share Christ with people, you can always know you're doing the right thing. Verse 17, that's what he's saying. Uh, as of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And he's saying here, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Uh, I think I've come up with a, um, a truth that will help you in, in life. When life gets complicated, your first suspect should be Satan. All right? That's what he's saying here. When, when life gets complicated, you know, things are getting out of hand, your first suspect should be Satan. Don't blame your husband. Don't blame your kids. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame the school, <laughs> the boss, you know, whatever. Uh, get down to the, to the nitty-gritty of things here. Uh, we, the battle's not in the flesh. The battle's in the spirit. So when it gets complicated, look for the simplicity in Christ. You know, most things in life have a pretty simple solution. Look for that simplicity in Christ and live for the victory uh, that is in Christ. Uh, I, I've enjoyed this chapter. I hope it's a, a blessing to you. Uh, Satan has his devices, but listen, Christ has his victory, and that's where we are. Let's, let's close by singing page 341. It's victory in Jesus. I think that would be a good way to, to end up. Ezra, why don't you come and lead us in? Let's just sing maybe the first and last verse of that.